usually do um, when I um, need some advice is I turn to the patient community. And um, Anil has gi uh, given me a, a very important response. Uh, he regrets he can't be here, but he's uh, monitoring it right now on Facebook. If you don't uh, follow Anil uh, on uh, Facebook and Twitter, you should. He's a reason enough to get involved. Uh, I think he's a very important, not only uh, an advocate, but an important citizen scientist. Anil is a ballet dancer. He's not a scientist, but he, um, he's uh, taken it upon himself to master all of the information available and to collate it and distribute it. And I depend on him um, very much for checking things out. And he's one of my important uh, Dutch advisors. Uh, I remember the first talk that I was invited to give uh, on chronic fatigue syndrome. It was a pub talk in um, Edinburgh. And I went wrong on the first slide because I said chronic fatigue, not chronic fatigue syndrome. And the patients educated me as to why that was an important distinction. I didn't make that mistake yesterday and had to explain why I wasn't talking on chronic fatigue the way I was supposed to be to the uh, occupational and uh, insurance physicians. Uh, what can I say? I left them confused and in doubt where previously they were certain. I think it will take a couple, go a couple more goes at it before I persuade them and convince them. But at any rate, Anil had been advocating um, that uh, Dutch patients uh, weren't in your face enough and that they were behind some of the other groups and he wanted to clarify that there was a time that was true but the time is not to be in your face right now the time is to get informed to network to ensure the best evidence is available not only to other patients but to the professionals who treat you and uh, I think that social media are going to be very important in that struggle and um, uh, he, uh, Anil has done some excellent blogs explaining his transition from being a lively, talented, uh, promising ballet dancer to getting a new pair of shoes and never being able to take it out of the box. And it's a very, um, I recommend his blogs to the physicians. I'm not sure if they'll go read them, but um, I can at least recommend them. <laughs> but there are others. I, I know Frank is in the audience. I, I didn't think he was going to be in the audience and didn't want to embarrass him. I know. What's the Dutch expression about the tall cornflower gets cut? You know, you don't like to stand out. But Frank has been an important advisor. And uh, he's uh, written some important uh, rebuttals to the PACE investigators. And in, um, in the land psychiatry, he, um, I first uh, became aware of when we had back-to-back -back papers in that journal uh, criticizing the follow-up study for PACE. And then he's gone on to do some more basic research. And again, he um, has taken the, the trouble to educate himself. Now, all of you don't have the time or energy or opportunities to learn the science, but you can sort of monitor and police uh, what's out there and keep bad stuff from getting into circulation uh, by not tweeting it, not getting into it, and, um, but also um, facilitating the, uh, the, the movement of good stuff. Uh, back in the 90s, I got caught up in another patient movement. It was called The Force, facing our risk of cancer in power. And it was a group of physically healthy women who knew that they were at high risk of breast and ovarian cancer. And they had made the decisions to um, have the breasts and ovaries removed after they had had their last child that they wanted. And they were pestering physicians to give them a hormone replacement. And they wouldn't do it because they, they, they were nervous about it. The evidence was there, but they were nervous about it. And uh, I got a series of grants and wrote papers with them as they, they basically triumphed over the medical establishment, not going against the evidence, but using the evidence to convince um, uh, physicians to make changes that were needed. And we actually won a recognition from the BMJ, the FORCE website. Back then was uh, one of the most uh, trusted website, patient websites in the world, and Time Magazine even made uh, uh, Previver uh, one of the words of the year uh, in the 90s, and that described a person who was perfectly healthy, but was at high risk of breast cancer, was having to take action to deal with that. Um, 
But that was a different time. We had listservs. We could control, we could monitor the listservs 24 hours a day. We knew who was on there to keep some people off, uh, amplify other people. And it's very different with the internet than when you, because um, anybody can go on there. A lot of non-patients are, are trolling. And a lot of people pretending to be patients who aren't. And it's much more difficult. But it, it, I've seen remarkable progress in the two years that I've been involved. Another person, uh, Mark Vink, um, I used a slide from him yesterday where he tested himself uh, using the PACE entry criteria um, and showed that he couldn't get into the trial even though he was bed bound. And then they, when they, ch they switched the, the scoring of outcome measures, so he was now <coughs> eligible to get in the trial, but was already recovered. And so he was a guaranteed success. And it was uh, disturbing to uh, the physicians yesterday to see uh, a slide from one of their own uh, indicating the absurdity of uh, what they were recommending, uh, um, cognitive behavior therapy based on the PACE trial. And he's a very trusted advisor. And uh, he's published some papers that um, really go into detail about um, uh, the, the possibilities of recovery. Um, now, my appearance today wouldn't have been possible without the, the patients uh, uh, contacting me. Uh, my initial involvement in, the, in chronic fatigue syndrome was by patients pestering me. They said, you're going after all this positive psychology bullshit. And we've got this PACE trial that is just uh, the ultimate bullshit trial. And, um, and I was reluctant. And then they sent me an article from The Telegraph, which Michael Schopp was uh, uh, quoted as saying that positive uh, thinking and exercise could overcome um, chronic fatigue syndrome. And I put a tweet up, I've had it, Michael. I'm going to trash your study on Thursday. And that's the often battle. At the time, I was... I wouldn't say I was close friends, but I was friends. I had shared two bottles of wine with Michael a few years ago. I'd gone to dinner with uh, Trudy um, Shoulder, and I was in regular contact with Simon Wesley. And uh, all those relationships went by the wayside. I don't regret it. Um, I, I think history will judge them. They're wrong. And history's on your side. Um, some of you know that I had a big event yesterday, and thanks for Jim Fast for arranging that. Um, I think I really freaked out some of those physicians. Um, so start with, that's the Boston Tea Party. And that's when um, the Boston colonialists, uh, colonists decided they wouldn't buy the British tea anymore, and they threw it overboard. <coughs> By the way, their sense of spunk. Does anybody know where they came from? They came from England by way of Leiden. They learned a lot about law before they settled the colony. And that was a very important influence on the way they responded to the British. Um, so at any rate, what was, what's happening in the, UK, in the United States, and hopefully spread in the UK, is that a lot of what these physicians were told yesterday about chronic fatigue syndrome is wrong. A lot of what they think they know is wrong. In fact, the word is wrong, and it's being replaced by myalgic encephalitis. Um, and um, in fact, whoops, um, and I put those words to draw the attention. I'm a dyslectic and I have a big problem with myalgic encephalitis. Encephalitis, yeah, I didn't even got wrong. ME. And, uh, but they better get used to it. They ought, to, they ought to roll off their tongue. It has the same way with post-exertion malaise. But what the American government has done, this is absolutely amazing. The Institute for Medicine report in a CDC <laughs> website emphasized that post-exertional malaise and getting more ill after any effort is a defining symptom. If it's not there, it's not chronic fatigue slash ME. And CBT and graded exercise are no longer recommended by the CDC as treatment because of potential harm to patients and ineffectiveness to the rest of the patients. But is really mind-blowing is the Agency for Healthcare Research Quality will no longer accept Dutch studies into their data bank because they consider the diagnoses um, too loose um, to be integrated with uh, valid diagnostic. So if you do a trial like FitNet, is not allowed to be entered as evidence. It's inadmissible evidence in the United States because of the loose diagnostic criteria. Besides that, they switch to outcomes. Well, that's a talk for another day. Um, 
So um, I, I'm sure that uh, Cleese uh, Leisenberg is not present. I would, I, if, if he would be willing to debate me, I'd fly over on my own dime and come here and debate him. Um, I think he talks such crap. And um, I'll be blogging about this. But what he says recently in the Dutch media is that the PACE investigators conclude that CBT leads to decreased levels of fatigue and all over improvement of well-being. Based on supplementary analysis, they concluded that a subgroup of patients made a full recovery from CFS. Not everybody endorses these conclusions, however, their objections are mostly baseless. Hell, I've got more citations than he has. I don't know if that arrogance came from Google Translate or if it was theirs present, but that is an arrogant misunderstanding of the literature. And if we look at the, it's the, the PACE trial, it's discredited Oxford diagnostic criteria. They're far too loose to, for scientific study, far too heterogeneous a group of patients, far too mild a group of patients, and far, far too much high psychiatric and physical comorbidity. And a poorly matched control group. I've argued in a number of places that the, the poor control of nonspecific factors, of, of support and positive expectations, in the PACE trial would have led homeopathy to be shown effective. And uh, subjective self-report outcomes are highly susceptible to whatever mood disturbance and the responsiveness of the mood disturbance to support and expect changes in expectations. So as I said, it, homeopathy uh, would, have, would have shown, at least homeopathy, it's, it's useless, it's a waste of money, but it doesn't hurt people. C, um, CBT and um, get Ken. Now, um, when you do a clinical trial, you're supposed to register ahead of time so you publicly commit yourself to outcomes and you'll analyze them according to a plan that you established. The PACE investigators did that after they had been collecting their data and they knew from other trials that, the, that their, um, their pre-decided outcomes would have produced a null trial. They wouldn't have gotten results unless they switched outcomes. And uh, they, they changed their outcomes after peeking at other people's data. They suppressed analyses that didn't point, uh, uh, um, support their view, and I'll, I'll come back to that one. And then they ignored international and British requirements for sharing data. Some of you know there have been a long battle with the uh, PACE investigators. They published their famous Lancet paper, but they also published a paper in PLOS One, where I'm an academic editor. And if you publish in PLOS One, you have to have your data available for reanalysis. And so I requested the data very politely, and uh, they refused, and they decided that I was vexatious. That I was, because they, they actually cited in a court hearing my tweets, saying, look at this threatening guy. If we give him our data, he's just going to embarrass us, and we'll suffer reputational damage if he gets a hold of our data. Um, and, uh, but we, I haven't won that battle yet, but I had an important development a few weeks ago when PLOS agreed to issue an expression of concern for the PACE trial paper. They, and that's the next step before retraction. And I believe that they'll let it be retracted or they'll cut a deal with PLOS because they can do that in the UK, but they won't give me the data because they know that I know what's hiding there. If you look at the, the blue is their claim data in the Lancet paper, their, their, their rates of improvers. And then the orange is if they had stuck to their original outcomes. And it's a dramatic difference. As you can see, there's huge improvements for, uh, rates of, uh, of improvement for uh, CBT and GET. But then if you go back to the, the measures, it goes away. Um, now, in the 80s, I was a harsh critic of Aaron T. Beck, arguably the father of cognitive behavior therapy. He once introduced me as a party, as a wolf who roamed around his data sets, picking off the weak data. And he said, my, my herd has some weak members. We need to strengthen. And he toasted me. And he, got, he invited me to observe him do psychotherapy. And I can tell you, what Aaron T. Beck does with patients is not what's done in the PACE trials. It's not what's done in the Dutch trials. Cognitive behavior therapy, 
provided is not recognizably CBT by international standards. It's only other uh, uh, people treating chronic fatigue syndrome in these trials that think so. And there's my, there's my, obviously that's, that was a while ago for me, and Beck wasn't even 85 then, I think he's in his 90s now, he's just got another grant. And um, so that's hanging out with Tim, is people get to know him, you, first thing is, you, you no longer have to call me Aaron, that's sort of like an um, initiation. But anyway, um, real CBT, it's collaborative. It's collaborative, you listen to the patient, you don't assume what the patient wants to work on. With chronic fatigue syndrome slash ME, you don't assume that fatigue is necessarily the most pressing, burning problem for the patient. It may be uh, orthostatic intolerance, or it may be um, the um, um, <coughs> debilitation from uh, exercising. And um, you recognize and utilize the patient's resources. You recognize and, and, and um, accept the patient's limitations. If anything, rather than getting behind the patient and pushing them, you stand in front and slow them down a little bit so they take credit for overcoming you along with whatever else they're doing. And uh, you pursue limited but significant goals. And you adapt to the patient's readiness for change. That's not, it's a harangue. It's, it's, um, it's a coercion that occurs in CBT in, um, as it's done in the Netherlands for um, CE and uh, C CFS and ME. So um, back to uh, Cleese, his illusions are maintained by relying on unblinded design subjective self outcomes. He's smart enough to know how to do a clinical trial. He knows what he's doing. I don't believe he's that stupid. And the non-specific factors are concentrating the active treatment. He suppresses scoring of outcomes. He suppresses contradictory data. I want to come, have him come down here and debate. Why does he hide this study? He, he took the, the objective data that was buried in Amsterdam and put it into a paper. He showed none of the Dutch trials have ever affected um, objective measures of, uh, of activity. They improved subjective measures, not objective measures. There's a fourth study since that. Now, um, it's sort of a back to the future. If we start talking about um, ME again, uh, first we're going to get out of the category of medically unexplained symptoms. That's an unvalidated, invalid um, psychiatric category. The developers of the DSM have been extremely <coughs> uncomfortable with so-called somatoform um, dis disorders because they rule out disorders. You could have lots of physical problems identifiable, but be labeled as medically unexplained symptoms if, you, if your physician is annoyed with you and thinks you're, um, you're not um, uh, responding to uh, their advice. Um, and I think this is a very important movement. Um, I, 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 I'm totally behind it, and I think that you'll get a lot of international support because they know what a, a lot of us who don't know about chronic fatigue syndrome initially no, it's a garbage category, uh, medically unexplained symptoms. It's an embarrassment to psychiatrists. And this is a silly diagram that uh, I, I keep going at. This um, Danish, uh, one of uh, Peter Fink's uh, underlings, keeps writing these papers, and he, he keeps attacking me and complaining to Plos that I'm being unfair to him when I say that his, his work is garbage. But this is his uh, patient education uh, pamphlets. Uh, is kind of voodoo-y pseudoscience about how somehow bad things that happened in your past or in your recent uh, history cause you to have medically unexplained symptoms. Now, the fact is that ME was an accepted classification since 1969. Under the influence of the English, Americans decided that they would downplay it and they would accept in 1988 chronic fatigue syndrome. And we now recognize that's a mistake because it trivializes a condition. And um, we now recognize that uh, MECFS is characterized by neurological, immunological, gastrointestinal, cardiovascular, and muscular features. And you can get that, you can figure that out if you do a proper diagnosis and don't limit it to six months of fatigue, which is what the PACE trial did. 
And here are the proposed criteria. Um, the, um, as you see, the, it's not just a matter of fatigue. It's post-exercise malaise is a requirement. And unrecognized, uh, unrefreshing sleep is a requirement. If you apply those criteria, the Dutch trials are getting a milder group of people who don't actually have this condition. There are other people in the group who have serious uh, undefined problems with fatigue, but they're not ME. But the people with ME are, are susceptible to being hurt by what's going to be asked of them in the trials. And furthermore, they have to have additional the um, cognitive impairment or the orthostatic intolerance. And the post-exertional malaise, um, I think you really need to educate your um, physicians about that. And I, I know when there was a point in the 90s where I thought that I, I was able to treat chronic fatigue syndrome. And they weren't chronic fatigue syndrome patients. I was working on highly specialized mood disorders, uh, and the patient population had had depression two or three years and had been unresponsive to treatment. They were brought into the hospital, they were taken off all their meds and rebuilt the meds until they found the ones that worked. And typically they were an MAOI inhibitor, people know what that drug is, it's one that Americans were kind of reluctant to use because you can't eat pepperoni pizza or fava beans or uh, Dutch cheese. Uh, because uh, when you're on that, so you just have to get dietary restrictions. But so these patients had to rebuild their lives. I would work with them. I'd give them small behavioral tasks. It looked like wonders. Then the word got out that I was treating chronic fatigue syndrome. My colleagues actually wrote papers about chronic fatigue syndrome. None of the patients had it. They were all melancholic patients. The problem with they were fatigued, but the main problem was really difficult to get them going because they had no sense of pleasure. So when they went out and did something, they, they didn't benefit from it. So the word got out in the medical center, we are tr successfully treating chronic fatigue syndrome, and then we started getting referrals from rheumatology. Wow, it was entirely different. They were a lot more res uh, receptive and enthusiastic about accepting the assignments. I, um, I, I often would get patients to call me, uh, what they do, go out and do an assignment, like little assignments. They wanted to get socially engaged and say, well, could you take, an, uh, take a, a napkin to a social gathering, get me three little cubes of cheese, two salamis, and three olives. And if someone says, what are you doing there? Uh, Dr. Coyne couldn't come. I thought I'd bring him some food and just get out of there. Well, what if I want to socialize? No, your only assignment is to get there, get the food, and get out. Or we'll go downtown and find the names of three dogs. The dogs are tied up along the, 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 uh, the uh, parking meters. You can't ask the dogs. You have to interact with people. And then you get your next session. The, the depressed patients would grumble to do it. The, uh, the people I got from rheumatology would do it. I'd get a call from them. I felt great, thank you. Bam! They would fall apart within, within a day, another day. It scared me. I stopped uh, accepting any patients. And I recognized I was up against something I didn't understand. But too often, people don't recognize the post-exertional malaise. And so they don't get it, how much harm they're doing. Okay, a cynical view of the PACE trial. Why do they keep holding on to the pseudoscience? Well, there's a conflict of interest in the design of the study. The, the um, public works and pension 